welcome to the Giving Voice to Depression podcast, produced in partnership with the A.B. Corcor Foundation for Mental Health. I'm Terry, the creator and co-host of this podcast. I've lived with depression most of my life, and I know how easy it can be to feel all alone in the experience. I'm not alone, and you aren't either. And I'm Dr. Anita Sands, a licensed clinical psychologist with a number of my own diagnoses, all of which bring a certain amount of anxiety and depression along with them. There is great power in shared experiences. We share our own as we engage in intimate and candid conversations with our weekly guests, exploring different perspectives on and experiences with depression. We keep it real because depression is real. We keep it hopeful because there truly is hope in spite of what depression tells you. Hi, Terry. Hello, Anita. So when exploring a topic as big as mental health, or even the more specific focus of depression, it's pretty common to have either a macro or a micro lens on the topic. Those of us with depression might see our experience as the experience. If we shut down and isolate when we're in it, we might think that's the way depression manifests for everybody. But some people get angry, or something else entirely. And then there are the researchers and experts who studied depression, but not lived it. And they look at the numbers and trends and depression's relationship to trauma, mental health care access, and even suicide. And theirs is that broader 30,000 foot view. Both are important and valid, the personal and that broad view. So it's a real bonus when a guest speaks to both their own experience and the larger experience of mental health challenges. Last week, Lacey shared with us how her depression, panic disorder, and bulimia surfaced in her early teens, how her family, though resourced and caring, just didn't have the tools to understand and talk about those challenges, as well as the role that therapy played in her self-care and recovery. So today we continue our conversation with Lacey, one we excavated from our archives because there is so much value in it that we want our newer listeners to hear it. In this conversation, Lacey shares what she's learned from both being a long-term therapy patient and now a mental health care provider. Here now is Lacey giving her voice to depression. Lacey believes that much of what is labeled as mental illness because of a person's behaviors is actually a normal human reaction to painful circumstances in a person's life. It's that shift in perspective that's summed up by the difference between asking, what did you do, and what happened to you that led you to behave in that manner. That's why Lacey says it can be really important to seek support, professional or otherwise, from someone with first-hand experience. You know, if you were a therapist that hadn't had those own experiences, I think that you would think that recovery is more linear than it is. Um, Because the job that I work now, especially with homeless outreach, these people have such such complex lives and so one of the first things that you're taught while getting into this job is the stages of change that you can go in and out of wanting help not wanting help making progress not making progress and people would see people see maybe symptom symptoms being more pervasive once again in their lives as taking quote taking steps back but it's not in recovery. Um, somebody who's been through recovery would know that it is, it's not like that. Far from linear, Lacey describes recovery as all over the board and more of a circle than a line. You go in and out of periods of hopelessness and hopefulness and going, going through periods of feeling like, no, I, I got, I have my feet under me again. And then something in life happens and your feet get swept out under you and you're back to square one. But I think that's the beauty of, of the work that we do is knowing that life is both the light and the dark. And if, if, if recovery was a thing of like, we're on this straight and narrow path and then we get to our destination then then what then right like it's it's 
if you didn't have something to always be working at, then that wouldn't be what life is. It's just, it's mental health is just like a reflection of life's journey in and of itself. Um, and it's all about just riding that roller coaster. And Lacey cautions that to someone who has no similar personal experience, that totally typical process and journey can be perceived and labeled as backsliding or failing, even by therapists. But I would say there's no such thing as regressing in in somebody's journey. Um, And that's something, you know, that you, especially with those in substance use that are struggling with their substance use and a mental illness at the same time, that that's that's just the, the name of the game. Like a lot of substance use counselors would tell you that they don't believe um, that somebody is actually recovered unless they've been through a relapse. Um, and so and that and that's a perspective that only somebody who's been through recovery themselves would be able to say. Lacey's personal perspective takes that to another level relapse or regressing or quote taking a couple steps back in my eyes is actually taking a few steps forward because you need those experiences otherwise if you were to be depressed and then come out of that and never regress ever again like i i i don't even know if that exists um because i mean that's the beauty of of growing of healing is that you gain the tools to to fall back and then pull yourself back up and each time you have to do it you get a little stronger when you look at it as a lifelong thing and not just a period of your life then you have a lot more grace for all the all the twists and turns that it brings you I think to the not just being able to pull yourself up when we have our, I think you call them steps back, but to recognize the signs that we're doing that, that we're sliding, that we're losing a little bit of ground, losing our footing a bit. The more we have those experiences, the sooner we're able to notice when it's happening, I think, and do something then, as opposed to when we're in the pit, when I think it's really, really hard to do much of anything. I, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with that, really. Um, it's been true for me, and I know it's been true for the friends. Um, I, you know, most of my close friends also suffer um, from some sort of mental illness, and uh, it connects us all, and I think we would all agree with that. One friend in particular, who Lacey says is very open about her experience and wouldn't mind her sharing, was diagnosed with bipolar disorder in college. For her, when she starts feeling those symptoms coming up, instead of going out of her way to avoid it by working harder or going out with friends and drinking it away or, you know, just distracting herself with various things, you know, she actually takes the moment to identify those things and just sit with them. And now she calls me when she's feeling those things come up. Lacey says the two of them talk all the time about how far they've come in their mental health journeys and the strength their recovery requires. And and I say strength, but, you know, it's our own version of strength and that we know that there's strength in weakness and that we're able to hold on to that weakness and not, like, not avoid it, not run from it um, and have it some, be something that basically is another excuse to bond with people, to reach out to the people who love you despite the things that you're feeling or in, or even because of the things that you're feeling. Those dark parts of my friends are the reasons why I'm so close to them. And I love those parts of them just as much as I love the parts of them that society deems more acceptable. Um, So, yeah, I couldn't agree more with that. Interesting. So when a total stranger called you and asked if you would like to talk about depression on a podcast, was there anything that you thought, I want to make sure I say this, or this is something that I know that I think people need to hear? The audience pretty much is people with depression, hopefully also people who want to better support people in their lives who do have it. I would say as far as people who are wanting to help others or even just like people with depression who are wanting to explain to others how to best help them is I I would say that most people in my life, when I bring things up like this, or at least in the beginning, the awkwardness that surrounds these conversations because people don't know what to say. They feel like they need to say something that will fix it. 
something that will help that person like in that moment. And I think in that case, the most important thing you can do is recognize that there is no perfect thing to say and that that person just needs somebody to sit and hold space with them. I was really, really, really looking for somebody just to let me sit next to them and cry um, and get a hug and be told that it was okay to feel whatever I was feeling and that I, that, that that person didn't need to understand it. Another really helpful and important message for anyone trying to support another person who needs us is to never, ever assume that letting you know they're struggling is an easy thing. And for those of us wanting and needing support, I think it's very important for people who are going through it to to find somebody, whether that's a therapist or a close friend or a family member that can be trusted, to just tell them, like, look, hey, when I'm going through this, I just need somebody to help hold space for these emotions because they're bigger than me sometimes. And if you have just one person that you feel like you can do that with, like, it, it makes an astronomical amount of change. Which Lacey, like all of us listening know, is really in conflict with what our minds are telling us at that point. It's it's telling you that you're alone in those feelings, that no one else is feeling the way that you're feeling. And A, that is true because it's a completely individualized experience. But I think once you accept that and know that the generalness of it, that the feeling of each one of us is going through a different experience, but we can come together in that feeling is important. Given how difficult the ask for support can be, Lacey offers some language that people who want to help can use to make it a bit easier. I guess people who have somebody with depression in their lives shouldn't ever make something sound easy like that, right? Like recognizing, I know it's going to be the hardest thing that you've ever done, but I need you just to tell me, just to tell me, right? And I won't try to sit here and fix you. I will just listen. And then whatever you say that you need for support, I will do, which whether if that's like just standing by, whether that's helping research for a therapist, whether that's, you know, starting to go on runs, like exercise was a huge factor in my mental health. Um, And so the list goes on and on on how you can support somebody. But I just feel like people feel like they need to have the answers and you just really don't. There is no answers in this um, because it's such, it's such a, unique experience to each person and really you can't you can't ask somebody directions to a place they've never been did you catch that what a great phrase you can't ask someone directions to a place they've never been very interesting so if we're not to have the answers for other people because they're hard enough to have for ourselves what are some good questions to have My first question always is, are you looking for advice? Are you looking for solutions? Are you looking for somebody to hold space? Because I think that we're, at least my experience, it, that the answer to that depended on the day and what I was feeling at the moment. You know, I'd have people trying to tell me what to do all the time in my depression of just like, well, just get out, Joe, go outside, just do this, just do that. And I, you know, would a lot of times think to myself, like, I'm not asking for your solutions. I just want you to listen. If you're a regular listener, you recognize that as one of the most common comments from our guests. Yet, we'd bet that an awful lot of people would be very surprised and probably relieved to learn that. Because, uh, I mean, a lot of the times, really, the simplest solution, quote-unquote, in those moments is really just to be heard. Once you you get that off of your chest and your heart, like, that's why journaling works so well for people, is just putting it out of your head and onto paper or having somebody else hear you just getting it out of your system is such a release for people that's why therapy works a lot of the times even with therapists that don't have the answers because as those of us who've been in therapy for a while have learned we know ourselves and our needs better than anyone else although we may need help reconnecting with that intuition when depression and other things off center us when I'm in therapy, I, I end up speaking so much about my experiences that I come to my own solutions myself because we, like, like I truly believe that we have whatever we need within us 
and that the best therapists, the best friends, the best family members are people who are just there to help you see those things. One common conversational mistake made in many situations, not just conversations about mental health, is the reflex to try to demonstrate understanding by sharing a similar story. But Lacey says that can end up closing a door that is much safer left open. For example, like when my grandpa died and I was trying to talk to my friends about it, they would say, I know exactly how you're feeling. My grandpa died and blah, 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 blah. Right. And I would just think to myself, I don't want to talk to you about your grandpa right now. It's about my grandpa. And you don't know my grandpa. You don't know the love that him and I had. It's not the same. Lacey says she understands that people have really good intentions when they talk like that and that they're just trying to use their experience as a way to connect with another person, in theory. In reality, they're just ostracizing them and making them feel as though, like, the conversation is being turned away from them. And somebody who's suffering from depression, who is already having a hard time bringing those things up, Making them feel like it's about you and not them is going to make them feel like, well, why did I even bring this up to begin with? I I can barely even contemplate my existence, let alone your existence and your feelings right now. So I guess I guess now that I say all that, it's more of what you don't say than what you do say. I think the I think the less words in this circumstance, the better. The more you can get them to talk, and the less you talk, um, unless they're specifically asking otherwise, um, is is important and something that I think is very undervalued. I would agree, because the average human isn't heard you know you might listen to them but hearing them is such a different thing that when we have the opportunity to do that for someone um, it is a gift and it, it in itself can be healing I think oh yeah a lot of my clients have never been heard by a single individual in their entire lives and it makes them very angry um, and you know anger is a secondary emotion and a lot of the times that first emotion is just sad, is depressed, is hurt. And, you know, they they spend all their lives trying to tell people that they're hurting and then just not being heard. And then they realize that anger will get them further um, because people are forced to address anger more than sadness. Um and this, I mean, that's not just for people with mental illness, but for everyone in, in general is like knowing in life that above all that humans just want to be seen and heard is something that can change your interactions with everyone, um, everyone and anyone that you have a relationship with. So, Terry, I think Lacey just really helped to drive home and and help me to remember that the most powerful things that we do to help is notice, ask, and listen. And those seem like maybe maybe to the average person, it feels like you're not doing anything. But again, those those are the most powerful things. We need to notice if somebody is not doing well. We need to ask them. And then we need to be quiet and listen to them when they when they want to if they want to tell us what what's going on. I'm going to add two things. First, I'm going to say and re ask because mm-hmm. I think that when you ask someone how they're doing, they're going to say fine. It's what yes. we've all been conditioned to say. Oh yeah, you have to get that out of yes, the way first, exactly. and then you have to say no. How are you? How are you doing? Really? Exactly. No, I really want to know. And then listen. There have been some themes over seven years of interviewing people that consistently come up. And I'm really not sure that anyone, when I said, what would have helped? What do you want? What do you wish someone did? What is your advice for someone with a partner or friend or a child with a mental health condition who hasn't replied that? Just be Mm -hmm. there. Just listen to me. Let me know that even in it, I am loved and accepted and that you can handle whatever I have to say or leave me alone if I, not leave me alone, but or not force me to say something that I don't want to say, Mm -hmm. but just be there. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's a huge It sounds so simple, right? Well, yeah, (laughs) but but how many times has it happened? Yeah. Yeah. 
No, that's that's why I just really I love that message is, you know, pay attention, ask. I like that you said re-ask and mm-hmm. then listen. Mm-hmm. Listen and be there. It's it it's a it's a simple recipe. It doesn't require that you have years of experience working with mental health, yep. you know, issues. It's just, you know, the best of your humanity reaching out to another human. And I have shared in the past that I had a friend who when he was in it just wanted to be left alone, physically Mm -hmm. alone. And he would say, I will resurface in three or four days, I'll be in touch. Mm -hmm. And okay, but you're never sure if somebody's safe either. So I would just regularly, and I don't mean like every half hour or anything, but you know, a couple times a day, I would say you are physically alone because you told me you want to be, but you're not alone. I'm here. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. anytime you change your mind, we can talk on the phone or in 45 minutes, I can be there. So Mm -hmm. you can kind of split the difference a little bit. I don't know that somebody, well, how could I possibly know how somebody else would react? But if I got a text that said that, Mm -hmm. I would be like, oh, good to know and delete. You know, I I, I probably wouldn't call them, but who knows? But it would be nice to know, you know, that, that when I said, leave me alone, you didn't go off on a vacation or you're not out water skiing, completely forgetting about me, Mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. And, you know. I th- I think this might need to be said um, that we all lead really busy lives and mm-hmm, it's so mm-hmm. easy to get distracted with all of the things that we're, you know, we're trying to stay on top on uh, or on top of. And um, it might not be a bad idea if, you know, you've you said that you're going to be there for someone or you opened up the conversation Just to put a reminder, you know, in your phone, on your calendar, put a little sticky note somewhere that just says, hey, check in with so-and-so. I think it's unreasonable for for us to think that we're going to remember um, some days, some weeks, you know, to check back in. But it is Mm -hmm. the checking back in. It is that, you know, what you just said that you did where you say, just a reminder, you know, I'm still here. I can be there. Um, Put it on the calendar, you know. That's put a it, great put, piece of advice. Put it out where you where it will remind you. It doesn't make you a bad person that you have to remind yourself to check no. in with someone. In fact, that that might be the thing that makes the difference. Yes, and I, and I have a friend who I I, I will ask first because you, you never know where somebody is exactly. But I'll mm-hmm. say, are are you in a space where you can handle something funny, or you would welcome something funny? And that's sort of our language with each other. And then we might have a little volley and she'll say like, keep it coming or something. And Mm -hmm. I'll send three or four things that I know are her sense of humor. And then I stop because, you know, she's in bed and doesn't really want to engage a whole lot. But Mm -hmm. for that little exchange, she knew I cared Mm -hmm. that I'm there, that I'm thinking of her. And she probably smiled or hopefully laughed if I chose things that that resonated with her. So Mm -hmm. there are so many ways. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm going to just flip now from being there for somebody else to one of the comments that Lacey made about uh, being there for ourselves, essentially. And it's a line that she said, the beauty of growing and healing is that you gain the tools to fall back on and then pull yourself back up. And each time you have to do it, you get a little stronger. And I really liked that Mm -hmm. because a lot of us aren't really depending on somebody else or can't or whatever. And we have to be able to take care of ourselves too. And I like that, oh, it's not turning it into a good thing because there is absolutely nothing about being in a depressive state that is good. But the next time you you can glean some information from that experience to help you get out a little earlier or, Mm -hmm. or, as I said, with less damage. Yeah, I mean, it really does challenge that that myth that, you know, you're a failure if you have a, a relapse or a resurgence of depressive symptoms, that somehow you're you're doing something wrong if, if they're back, you know. So, yeah, just that idea that relapse or regression is a part of both the recovery process. It's also the part of certain disorders. Um, they're, mm-hmm. they're, they're, you know, you don't get better in a straight line. So ups and downs and and working with those. And, and again, what she's saying is that you learn something that can help you, you know, the next time. It's a, it's a very optimistic, positive way of looking at something that really feels awful when it's happening. It really feels awful mm-hmm. when it's happening. Absolutely. So thank you, Lacey, especially mm-hmm. for having taken time during a vacation to talk to us. And thank you, Anita. It's always so nice to have uh, somebody with your experience weigh in on these ideas and topics. Thanks, Terry. 
And please remember, if you'd like, you can leave a voice message for us at the givingvoicetodepression.com website or join us on our Facebook community because we would love for you to be a part of this. We truly hope that our podcast brings a little more understanding, helps you better articulate and reflect on your own experience with depression, or better understand how to support someone else who is struggling. If this episode has been of comfort or value to you, know that there are hundreds of others like it in our archive, which you can easily find at our website, givingvoicetodepression.com. And remember, if you're struggling, speak up, even if it's hard. If someone else is struggling, take the time to listen 